The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter program has come under a lot of scrutiny since production started in 2006. The F-35 is an ambitious program that hopes to fill the needs of the Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps with three different variants of the aircraft that try to share as much as possible between them. At the same time, the F-35 is trying to replace some very different aircraft. For example, it's trying to replace the aging F-16s and A-10s, likely the F-15 as well for the Air Force, the AV-8B Harrier and the F-A-18 for the Marine Corps, and the F-A-18 for the Navy. To accomplish this, the U.S. is planning on acquiring 2,456 F-35s. To purchase and maintain these aircraft, it's expected to cost over $1 trillion over the life of the program. Because of the cost, scope, and because the Department of Defense hasn't and likely won't start a major fighter program for some time, a lot is riding on the success of the F-35. So yeah, a high level of scrutiny is warranted. Most of the time the F-35 is in the news, it is not good news. And after seeing a series of articles in the news regarding government reports about the F-35 development and some of the issues that it's having, I wanted to dive deep into the status of the F-35 and see if the program is really in as bad of shape as the news makes it out to be. So in this episode of Learning Military, I've gathered congressional reports, publicly available military and government publications, articles from experts and other sources to share with you if the F-35 is really a broken weapons platform. So in this episode, we're going to look at the major issues with the F-35 and other problems that are causing them to be grounded. We're also going to look at another perspective of the program to finally analyze whether or not the F-35 has been a failure. The major report that spawned the latest news articles about the F-35 came from what was published in the Director of Operational Test and Evaluation's annual report. The purpose of his annual report is to test systems to determine whether or not a system is combat credible, operationally suitable, and survivable. The document covers a wide array of programs and weapon systems, which is really cool and I recommend taking a look at it, but again, for this video, we're just going to take a look at the F-35. During testing, the report states that the F-35 currently has, and this is as of November 1st, 2019, 873 unresolved deficiencies that range from software issues to weapons issues and structural issues. Of the 873 issues, 13 of them are listed as Category 1 issues. Valerie Encina, someone who I will likely mention a lot in this video, is an air warfare reporter for Defense News and has written extensively on the F-35 and outlines exactly what Category 1 issues are. They're defined as an issue that could cause death, severe injury, or illness, could cause loss or damage to the aircraft or its equipment, critically restricts the operator's ability to be ready for combat, prevents the jet from performing well enough to accomplish its primary or secondary missions, results in work stoppage at the production line, or blocks mission critical test points. Vice Admiral Matt Winter, the Defense Department's F-35 program executive, stated that Category 1 deficiencies have subcategories as well. Category 1As, or Cat 1 Alphas, he says, consists of issues that could cause loss of life, potential loss of life, or loss of the aircraft. As of right now, he says we have no Category 1 Alpha deficiencies. All of the 13 Category 1 issues are one step down at Cat 1 Bravo which Admiral Winter says have a mission impact with a current workload that's acceptable to the warfighter with the knowledge that we will be able to correct that deficiency at some future time. Remember, there are 13 of these kinds of issues across the F-35 program. And while the dot and &E report doesn't outline exactly what those 13 issues are, back in June of last year, Valerie and her team wrote about Category 1 deficiencies regarding the F-35 that gives us the best look into what these deficiencies might be. According to Valerie, some of those deficiencies are as follows. The F-35's logistics system, known as the Autonomic Logistics Information System, or ALICE, currently has no way for foreign F-35 operators to keep their secret data from being sent to the United States. The spare parts inventory shown by the F-35's logistics system, again ALICE, does not always reflect reality, causing occasional mission cancellations. Cabin pressure spikes in the cockpit of the F-35 have been known to cause barotrauma, the word given to extreme ear and sinus pain. In very cold conditions, defined as at or near minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit, the F-35 will erroneously report that one of its batteries have failed, sometimes prompting missions to be aborted. Supersonic flight in excess of Mach 1.2 can cause structural damage and blistering to the stealth coating of the F-35B and F-35C. Not only does this reduce its overall stealthiness, but it could cause damage to antennas located at the rear of the plane. 
After doing certain maneuvers, F-35B and F-35C pilots are not always able to completely control the aircraft's pitch, roll, and yaw. If the F-35A and F-35B blows a tire upon landing, the impact could also take out both hydraulic lines and pose a loss of aircraft risk. A green glow sometimes appears on the helmet-mounted display, washing out the imagery in the helmet making it difficult to land the F-35C on an aircraft carrier. On nights with little starlight, the night vision camera sometimes displays green striations that make it difficult for all variants to see the horizon or to land on ships. The sea search mode of the F-35's radar only illuminates a small slice of the sea's surface. When the F-35B vertically lands on very hot days, older engines may be unable to produce the required thrust to keep the jet airborne, resulting in a hard landing. Now there are other issues pertaining to weapons interfaces, but I wasn't able to find more detail. The 11 issues listed above though are the ones that I were able to find, and if I am able to find information about what the other two may be, I'll update this video. Now when looking at this list though, there are a few things to keep in mind. The first of which is that many of these issues are not common. They may have occurred either once or twice before, but don't occur frequently during regular operations. In addition, for some of these issues, there are already fixes identified or, in some cases, are ready to deploy. For example, the new Generation 3 helmet for the F-35 will resolve issues pertaining to the green glow and also the issue of seeing the horizon when night vision is needed. In addition, for the sun spikes in cabin pressure that cause barrel trauma, that's something that has been identified to be an issue with a particular sensor that can be repaired and replaced if needed. Knowing that other issues fall into these categories of having a fix already in place or identified is actually a positive sign about how the F-35 program is going. For some Category 1 deficiencies though, there's not going to be a fix anytime soon. One of those issues is the structural damage and blistering that occurs on the F-35 and its stealth coating when it goes faster than Mach 1.2 for an extended period of time. Now, because this would happen at the outermost limits of the F-35's operational conditions and because it hasn't happened every single time that the aircraft has traveled faster than Mach 1.2, the Department of Defense has just chosen to accept the risk of this issue. However, there have been some things that they have done to try and lower the chances of it happening, like the application of a new stealth coating in later iterations of the aircraft. This has allowed for better tolerance to heat coming from the engine when an afterburner but there's more that the DOD has done to reduce the chances of this occurring besides a new stealth coating. What the DOD has done is it has instituted a time limit for a pilot when using the afterburner. According to an article by Valerie Ancina and David B. Larder at Defense News, the F-35B can fly for 80 cumulative seconds at Mach 1.2 or 40 seconds at Mach 1.3 without risking damage. The F-35C can only fly at Mach 1.3 and afterburner for 50 cumulative seconds. These limits are important for the Marine Corps and the Navy who, when operating these aircraft at sea, have limited space aboard their ships and therefore don't have the same repair capabilities as if these F-35s were on a base. Limiting the chances that such an issue could take place, though, is critical to maintaining a high level of operational capability. That level of operational capability has been a key metric for the armed forces of the United States for some time. One similar metric, the availability rate for aircraft, measures the number of available aircraft able to perform at least one mission divided by the total number of aircraft. This would include aircraft undergoing major repair, and the target for this key metric is 65% of F-35s are available. According to the dot and &E report, the F-35 program over a 12-month period has averaged below that 65% availability target. The cause of this low availability rate can be attributed to a number of things that are outside the issues that we described above, but in many cases, these 13 Category 1 issues can contribute to that low availability rate. For example, the logistics supporting the aircraft have caused a number of delays. The F-35 uses software called the Autonomic Logistics Information System, or ALICE. This software can diagnose issues with the aircraft, it can provide training, technical data, allow for ordering of spare parts, and track the availability of said parts. While originally designed with the intention of simplifying and reducing the amount of time needed to complete the maintenance process, this software has often extended the maintenance time. ALICE is described as inefficient and cumbersome to use. 
The DOT and E report says that Alice still requires the use of numerous workarounds, retains problems with data accuracy and integrity, and requires extensive time from support personnel. Apparently, there's little trust in it working as intended. I found a few examples of these issues. One such example included how Alice wouldn't give the proper wait time for some components. A part, if entered into Alice, could show that it could take multiple years for that part to be available, and that was obviously not the case. And this could ground the plane for more time than needed. Also, Alice was responsible for other shipping and tracking issues which delayed replacement parts. Of course, Alice isn't the only thing that is responsible for issues with equipment. One of the things that have grounded planes in the past is the lack of spare parts that are available. In one article written by Valerie and Cinna, she noted that the Government Accountability Office found that from May to November 2018, F-35 aircraft across the fleet were unable to fly 29.7% of the time due to spare part shortages. From what I found, both Lockheed Martin and the United States government are blaming each other on why there is such a shortage of spare parts. Here's one example. The National Interest reported a new issue that the F-35 program is facing when it comes to the replacement of the canopies. Now, these canopies are more than just glass enclosures. The National Interest reports that the F-35 cockpits feature a special coating that reflects radar waves and prevents them from bouncing off inside the cockpit which is a potentially major source of radar returns. Therefore, if there is an issue with the canopy, it can take over a year to get the necessary replacements. These kinds of issues are tough to accept, especially with a program as expensive and important to the Department of Defense as the F-35 program. While much of this sounds extremely bad, there is an alternate view to all of this that I think is important to consider. The first of which is that these issues are being identified early on in the aircraft's life cycle. And there are things that we could do about these issues now and not when a large portion of the air power of the United States is the F-35. For example, the dot and &E report found that the F-35A has issues with its gun. There are misalignments, cracks, and other deficiencies that don't allow for the accuracy of the weapon to be within specifications. While not an issue with the F-35B and C variants due to their use of external pods, the F-35A can have the necessary fixes done and implemented now before being used in a heavy combat role where such a deficiency could be catastrophic. We have also seen improvements to the number of issues that the F-35 has had. In 2018, for example, the F-35 had 15 Category 1 deficiencies rather than the 13 it has now, and it also had 917 software deficiencies in 2018 as opposed to the 873 that there are now. While 44 fixes may not seem like it's that impressive, the dot and &E report indicated that some of the previous fixes had caused new issues to arise. Anyone who has been a part of software development of any kind knows that those things do tend to happen. Plus, the F-35 is still getting new systems and new features, and the expectations that those new additions would be bug-free from the outset are unrealistic. At the end of the day, the important thing is that we understand that this is a very complex weapon system, and it implemented a number of new technologies that are still in their infancy. To expect a fully working system at this stage in development is pretty unrealistic too. Though it's important to make sure that American taxpayers hold the government responsible for its actions in the development of the F-35. Along the same vein, the taxpayers need to make sure that the government is holding Lockheed Martin and other contractors accountable as well. With that in mind, while yes, there are problems that need to be solved and issues that keep arising, the F-35 is likely here to stay. Most of that is due to how much is riding on the F-35 to be successful, an aging fleet of fighter aircraft that are becoming obsolete due to advances by other great powers, the program is a job creator among a number of states and there's just so much money invested into it that we may become guilty of the sunk cost fallacy and figure we need to keep going. But the decision for the F-35 to enter full production is set to occur as late as January 2021. By then, we should know more about the state of the F-35 program, though it may still be like it is today. A problematic program, just not a failed one. This has been Learning Military. Thanks for watching.